Hi, so in the previous video we looked at starting to derive the new Keynesian model and looked at the implications that the imperfect competition in this model had on the economy and more specifically the output that was below the social optimum. And now in this video we're going to add menu costs to the mix and note that this only is something that we can really add to the model because we have imperfect competition and we have some sort of price setting power so we needed the prerequisite of our monopolistic competition so that we could have some rigidity and more specifically nominal rigidity in prices so prices don't necessarily adjust because if we have perfect competition if prices didn't adjust then we would have firms making negative profits and it wouldn't really make any sense so with that said let's get into menu costs so it's first worth noting that if we have flexible prices in this model then we still have that money is neutral we'll have that all our prices and wages just instantly adjust so a change in the money supply does not cause a change in output and so we just have that money is neutral and this whole video would be completely pointless the the money market and changing money supply and having shocks to the money supply would not change because prices would just instantaneously adjust. Now let's instead suppose that we have our prices are being set with some expectation of future money supply and future monetary policy and say we, we could think of this as that firms can only set their price every period, they're, they're setting their price one week and just making some expectation about the the level of the money supply in the economy and the price level of the economy. Now suppose that we have some money shock, so something unexpected happens and the money supply is not actually at the level that was invested or that was expected by these firms. So the, the price has been set using expectations but we've had something that has been different to what was expected. And we're also going to need that there's some cost of changing prices. So in order to change the price to respond to this unexpected money shock, the firm's going to have to incur some cost. And this is what we'd call a menu cost. This could be the cost of reprinting their catalogues or the psychological cost for, say, customers that don't like having the price changing every time they come into the store and they might they might go somewhere else so there's some there's some cost it could be any number of things we we call it a menu cost because you can think of it as the cost of reprinting a menu in a restaurant it, it costs some money for that paper and the time needed to do that well the implication of this is that firms might not change their prices if this menu cost is larger than the profit that they would gain from changing their price then they they might not change their prices because they have to incur some cost to change their prices and if um, we don't have flexible prices due to this then money supply would not be neutral a change in the money supply might have some impact on our aggregate output in the economy so that that's how menu costs sort of come into this model if we we know that we had our aggregate demand relation which was given by m over p well if we have this p is just being constant and not changing but we change the money supply well then we're going to have some change in output arising from this and this is the what we talk about so we can form formalize this a bit more by looking at the algebra of the situation and we can do this by looking for a symmetric nash equilibrium in this economy and this symmetric Nash equilibrium will be a case in where all firms uh, keep their prices fixed. And because we are thinking about a representative firm, they're all going to be the same. So we're looking for an equilibrium where every single firm just keeps their price fixed after some sort of money shock. And if every firm in the economy keeps price fixed, but we have a change in the money supply, then we can see that this might have quite a large effect on an aggregate scale for our aggregate output. And firms may have to reduce their output or increase their output to make up for the fact that they are not changing their prices, um, as, as a certain example. And this, this could then have real effects on our economy. So 
let's let's look for a symmetric Nash equilibrium by first assuming that every firm expects that all the other firms do not change their price after a money shock. And so in a Nash equilibrium we'll have everyone acting optimally or having a best response when compared to every other firm's actions. So when we're, we're looking at one individual firm and this one individual firm is assuming that everyone else does not change their prices and we're, we're assuming that we've had some money shock so that this is actually a meaningful discussion. So if now the firm that we are looking at does not wish to change its price, then not changing price is a Nash equilibrium because every other firm is not changing price and this one firm is also not changing its price. And because all the firms are identical, then everyone will be choosing a best response, so we have a symmetric Nash equilibrium. Now, how do we find a scenario where we have this symmetric Nash equilibrium, where it is optimal for everyone to keep their price fixed? Well, we can do this by comparing the profits of a firm when they do change their price and the profits of a firm when they do not change their price. And if the difference between these two levels of profits is less than the cost of changing the price, then it's a Nash equilibrium to not change their price. This may be a little bit confusing, but we have some cost of changing price, cost, uh, let's say menu cost. And so if a firm changes its price, it's always going to incur this menu cost. And so this is the cost of changing price, but we want to compare this to the benefit of changing price the benefit of changing price, which is just going to be a change in profits. So if this change in profits is less than the menu cost, then it's not going to be optimal to change your price because you're just going to be incurring a larger cost than your benefit. So this is what we're looking for here. What's the profits when a firm alters its price and what's the profits when a firm keeps its price the same? So in order to calculate these firm's profits, we can first remember this relationship we derived in the previous video. We had labor market equilibrium, and we had that we had some optimal labor supply for individuals, and we also aggregated our variables up to the aggregate economy by saying that everything was symmetric. We were using representative households and firms. So we knew that L was equal to Y, and we had our aggregate demand relation with a y is equal to mp so we just substituted that in here and we also derived that a firm's profit function looked something like this or exactly like this and this was just through um, we did a bit of substitution in the previous video so check that out if you have not already and okay so we we already derived this relationship so i won't explain where this came from but now using this labor market equilibrium, we can substitute in M4 W over P here with this Y to the power of gamma minus one. So we just substituted that in to get to the next line. And then the line after that, we have just brought this Y into the bracket. So simple stuff. We brought the Y into the bracket, so we have a Y uh, here and we have changed the power on this y to notice that we've brought this y into the brackets okay and then i've just substituted in using y equals m over p the the idea is just we're we're trying to you know, get get in a simple form what our profit function is we we could use this as a profit function but we we want this in terms of uh, the money supply and the price level preferably so that we compare it can compare it simply with our output when a firm changes its price. So our profit function looks something like this in terms of M over P, and then we can just take out a as a factor, or not even take out as a factor, we just multiply this PI over P to the power of minus eta into just into each of these terms. We just multiply that in and we get to this line of working where we have the the, our profit function in terms of our money supply, our price level, and our price of an individual firm. Now let's first look at the profits when a firm keeps its price the same. So if a firm is keeping its price the same, we, we knew that originally all the firms were identical, so they were all setting their price given their expectations 
of the price level and the money supply. So we would originally have that PI is equal to P, and we're saying that every firm is keeping their price the same. So we're going to keep this exactly the same. We're going to still have that PI is equal to P, and we know that that means that PI over P is equal to 1. And we can just substitute this 1 into our profit function here, and we get out this uh, profit from just keeping the prices the same. So this is our profit from not changing prices. We just have m over p minus m over p to the power of gamma. And so if we keep our prices the same, we're going to make this much profit. What we are interested in is how this compares to our profits if we didn't keep our price the same. How many? What profits are we going to make if we change price? So we've what we've done in the previous video is we derived what the optimal price level for the firm is and we knew that the optimal price level for a firm would have this sort of markup pricing structure because we had a we have monopoly power or at least some level of monopoly power in this market so we price based on our cost and we have some markup which is greater than one which is given by eta over eta minus one so if we're going to change the price the monopolistic competition or the firm that has some sort of monopoly power if they're going to change their price they're going to change it to this level because we've already derived that this is the optimal price level and again we can substitute in for w over p to get this in terms of m over p using the relationships that we've already looked at before and then once we have this we can then do derive our profit function in terms of um, the money supply and the price level. So what we can do with this PI over P is we can substitute this into the profit function that we derive, if I can keep, get these all on the screen at the same time, but we, we derive this profit function up here. So we have the our profit function was given by M over P multiplied by PI over P to the power of 1 minus A to minus this term and what we did here was we said that we're keeping the price the same so we're just going to set pi equal to p but now we've when we're changing prices we don't do that we set our price to this optimal price level and we substitute that into the profit function and that's what we get here this was this is our profit function when we've changed prices to the optimal level Ooh. actually no it's it's all of this so We've, we've got quite a big complicated profit function and I couldn't even fit it on one line of working but yeah, if we substitute that in and simplify it a little bit you'll still get this very complicated function so what we can do is we can then try to take out say eta over eta minus 1 to the power of minus n as a factor because this sort of appears here and here and then we want to be multiplying together our m over p's and m over p's to the different powers so we can so this would then be raised to the power of plus one and then this would be plus gamma and as you can see it's very complicated so we can just write down that uh, the if we simplify all this down we'd get a much simpler profit function it just takes quite a bit of quite a long amount of working so Okay, this is our profit function. Effectively, if we if we change prices, and I, w I won't derive the whole relationship there, but this is what we have. And so, what we've derived here, if I highlight them in red, this is our profits from changing prices, and this is our profits from keeping our prices the same. So, what we're interested in this new Keynesian model is we're interested in when do the firms not change their price well they're not going to change their price if the profits from changing price minus the profits from keeping their price the same are less than the menu cost so so this side is the benefit benefit of changing price and this is the cost of changing price, the menu cost. 
So if we have that the cost is greater than the benefit, then the firms are not going to change their price. And that that's what we have in the New Keynesian model, that we're, we're going to tend to say that there, this cost is going to at least sometimes be greater than the benefit of changing price. If we think of it just on a day-to-day -day basis, this menu cost for changing price is always going to stay the same. Let's say for a restaurant to change all the prices on its menu, it's going to cost it, say, fifty pounds to reprint every menu in the every men menu in the restaurant, um, change change the signs, all its labour costs of changing its signs outside. Uh, the psychological costs on its customers, so its regular customers aren't sure what the price is going to be when they come in, which they don't really like, they might lose customers. Let's say it's £50. And let's say one day we have a money shock where you know we, in we increase the money supply slightly. So the, the optimal price, okay, their original price was, say, £8.99 for some meal, and now, now the optimal price we've had a bit of inflation and the optimal price is now nine pounds and one and this was on Tuesday and this is on Wednesday well it's not hard to see that changing the price by two pence when the cost of changing price is 50 pounds it's not necessarily going to be optimal for them to change price every single day um, given inflation and we we're gonna have slightly sticky prices from one day to the next if we're talking about, say, the price in 2010 is going to be £8.99 and the optimal price in 2020 is actually going to be £11.99, well, changing the menu cost, changing from £8.99 to £11.99 is still going to cost £50 to change price, to reprint all your menus and everything, but now we're talking about a 10 year difference, so there's a much much larger benefit from changing price. Your optimal price is very different from your current price. So in this case, then we would maybe see that the restaurants would change prices, but on a short-term basis, they would not change price. So this is what we think about when we think of sticky prices. In the long run, we can have flexible prices, but in the short run, it's not necessarily beneficial. And this sort of working that we've done helps to flesh this out and give a better idea of this. So there's plenty of research that's gone into whether prices are sticky, whether prices do or do not adjust, and over what period of time you have to wait before prices do start to adjust. And maybe I'll do a video just summarizing some of that evidence. And um, but that will wrap up this video for the New Keynesian model with menu costs. So please do leave a like rating if this was at all useful. Do subscribe for future videos and check out the playlist for the future videos on this topic on the new Keynesian model.